Our main subject in literary studies is, of course, our primary texts. Most of them narratives in some way, shape or form. And yet we don't often talk about narratology in particular when we look at our literature. But it's something that cannot be ignored. The form of the text and its narrative are among the most defining aspects of the media of the book. This is precisely because all that which is in content is form. But I did just say narrative and then content. Or maybe I meant story. And I, I didn't imply they were synonymous. So what is the difference between narrative and story anyway? Basically, the story is what happens. Just the events and characters themselves, chronologically, the facts, if you will. Narrative, however, includes how these events are presented to the reader, listener, or viewer. In a narrative, a sequence of events might be told in reverse order, or the sequence of events could be connected via some sort of cause and effect chain. All of that is narrative, not story. If we thought about literature semiotically, which is a danger for us all, the story would be the signifier, the narrative, the mode of expression by which the signified is communicated. That would, of course, be a little bit reductive, but it might give you a good idea of what we're talking about. Scholars interested in narrative have tried to determine models that would describe all narratives to varying degrees of success. Those of you who perhaps dabble in creative writing themselves may have heard of the idea that there are only seven basic plot lines and all our narratives, be it on TV, in a book or in a game, are simply variations thereof. One such model would be this one right here, the accidental model of plot, which is used to describe story. But there are surely countless models, not only from the narrative study of literature, but also from film studies, theater studies, game studies, and so on that have also come up with their own models of narrative and story that could be relevant to our analysis of literature. The advantage of the actential model is that all actants within it can be characters, but they can also be objects or actions and so on. That does go some way to make the model universal-ish, as was undoubtedly the intent of the creator, the semiotician Algirdas Kreimers, who did claim that you would end up with this model if you dug deep enough on any narrative. A simpler, more basic model of action, of plot in a narrative, proposes a tripartite or three-act structure. Like the actual model of plot, it doesn't cover all narratives, but it does give you a useful idea of how a narrative arc may be structured and also provides a basis for variations, subversions, and challenges, which manipulate this basic principle going at least as far back as to Aristotle's poetics. This basic model of action begins with an introduction to the story, an exposition, a setup of all the important characters and elements. There then begins a rise of action where the main events get rolling. Think of Frodo leaving the Shire and going to Rivendell where he officially receives the task of his quest. In the middle comes a climax. The height of action, the drama, the confrontation between superhero and arch nemesis. It is followed by a fall. Action subsides, things become calmer, or a return, sometimes literal, to the point of origin occurs. At the end there is a catastrophe, not necessarily always a bad thing as it might just mean the final resolution of the story. Of course, you can already tell that not all narratives follow this structure. There might be open ends, after all, or there might be a cycle hinted at as opposed to this more teleological structure. See our video on narrative and time for a discussion on that. But it is a model that is still widely known and widely taught, sometimes followed and sometimes deliberately subverted to this very day. The earliest narratologists, if we exclude Aristotle, didn't even start at the level of plot models. They started with the smallest building block of narrative, the motif. According to Anne Rigney in her very informative textbook, The Life of Texts, a motif is the smallest building block of information in a narrative, concerning, for example, characters, actions and places. The Oxford Dictionary of Literary Terms, one of our regular ports of call if we want to get an initial idea of the exact meaning of a term, says A situation, incident, idea, image, or character type that is found in many different literary works, 
folk tales, or myths, or any element of a work that is elaborated into a more general theme. Once these motives have been identified, they can be used to compare narratives or to sort them into different genre categories. For example, the wise old wizard as a motif will often be found in fantasy narratives in particular, whereas the related trope of the wise old mentor can be more broadly applied. But wait a minute. You said trope, not motif. What's up with that? Well, the term trope is increasingly used as a synonym of motif. While some, if not most, dictionaries of literary terms still adhere to the original meaning of the word as denoting only a figure of speech, younger scholars in particular have taken to using it in the way readers and fandoms have been using it for quite some time. The word trope can still refer to any type of figure of speech, but it can also mean a theme, image, character, or plot element that is used many times, as an online dictionary of literary terms, linked below, tells us. The popular website TV Tropes is even more informative, albeit perhaps not entirely quotable in academic contexts. A trope is a storytelling device or convention. A shortcut for describing situations the storyteller can reasonably assume the audience will recognize. Tropes are the means by which a story is told by anyone who has a story to tell. When we study tropes or motifs, we often look into their representative capacity for modeling new ideas within broader networks of exchange and interplays. The power of tropes stems from their repeated usage. The cliché being scoffed at still holds a powerful representational value when cast in a new light. Tropes and motifs can be mixed together in a kind of recipe to cook up a genre. But before we reach that level, there's also the mode of writing to be considered. The spice, if you will. So let's say Tina and I both write the same story about a somewhat embarrassing experience I had that she witnessed. Maybe I was fixing a printer and the ink shot all over me in a despairingly, albeit hilarious, manner. In my version of the story, it would be dramatic and sad in tone, as my day is seemingly ruined, while perhaps for the onlooker, in this case Tina, she might just revel in the comedic nature of the situation. The modes of writing would be different. Tina's would be written with comedic timing, punchlines even. While my story might begin with the dreary weather outside, the lightning striking randomly, such modes can appear in pretty much every form of writing. Modes heavily influence how a story is narrated, and sometimes the connection is very obvious. For example, stream of consciousness or free indirect discourse could be seen as modes of writing, and these will occur across different genres. Sometimes, though, a mode and a genre may be so close that scholars will debate over which is which. Is the gothic a mode or is it a genre? What about fantasy? What about life writing? Certainly these genres also carry with themselves certain modes of writing, so it's not always clear where the boundaries are and if such boundaries are actually useful. After all, even the term genre itself is kind of fuzzy. As we mentioned before our excursion into modes, it is from various assemblages of tropes that genre begins to emerge. Generic conventions are a combination of a variety of formal elements, but tropes are almost certainly the most obvious and direct means by which consumers, readers, and watchers are able to identify genre. The drizzling rain and the fog outside, the unshaven man, cigar in his mouth, dressed in his suit jacket and a fedora, peers through his blinds. His beautiful and rich client enters his office, clutching her pearls. The combination of setting tropes and the character motif of the hard-boiled detective is at work here to tell us that this is an example of the detective noir story. Motifs and tropes work together to construct some of the obvious content elements, and they do it in a formal way. That is to say that they inform and impart the structure of the text in itself. Certainly it's not always so formulaic though, and that's where interpretation becomes especially meaningful. The ambivalences are of keen interest here. Genre, as you can tell, 
is a kind of formal convention rather than the content alone. It collects conventions and their history rather than just plots themselves. Although there is a strong relationship between the two. A literary genre is, in theory, a recognizable and supposedly established category that uses such common conventions in order to prevent readers from mistaking it for another kind. Of course, such a rigid definition is in its own right somewhat useless. It mistakes consumers or readers as being universal in their understanding of genre when distinctions are made due to formal and content decisions rather than due to reception alone. The distinction between different genres can be based on a variety of criteria. For example, you may distinguish genres by the basic mode of expression. The novel is a literary genre, and so is poetry or the epic. Another form of distinction could be the formal structure. There's the sonnet with its very strict set of rules, and then there's the haiku, perhaps equally strict but also entirely different. And yet both are forms of poetry, so you can already tell that these genres are not mutually exclusive. A text or narrative can fall into more than one category, though a poetry is perhaps one genre that very rarely also contains a narrative, which is what we are concerned here. But even there you have exceptions like the ballad or the long-form poem. We also sometimes sort narratives into different genres by their length. A novel is not a novella, is not a short story, is not a short short story, is not flash fiction. Of course, we can also talk of matters like intent, as in the case of satire, parodies, or pastiches, even the homage. The effect or response to a work could even categorize it too. Comedy, and I don't mean the drama category, is a wonderful example of that. Intriguingly, we sometimes even speak of different genres based on their origin. We have folk tales, myths, and legends which may look exactly like a short story, for example, but are perceived as something different. Some people would even argue that colonial and post-colonial literature falls into this category. Subject matter is one of our most obvious examples, and it connects to our more precise definition that we started with. Pastoral, science fiction, fantasy, and westerns are all great examples. Although that's not to say they don't have other defining factors or that the boundaries between them aren't fluid. In fact, mixed forms or the combination of various generic conventions and criteria is becoming increasingly popular. Think of science fantasy like Doctor Who or Star Wars, or even sci-fi westerns like Westworld. Genres vary dramatically in their stability Literary fiction is whatever academics are writing about, and not mocking at a given time. Fantasy could be ridiculed in one decade and termed magic realism in the next. Realistic fiction is expansive, since the real is very open to interpretation, and the very naming of a real fabrication or fiction is an innate contradiction that opens up a well of possibilities. Something like the Shakespearean sonnet has greater restrictions than free verse poetry. A spy novel has greater limits on its content than, say, fantasy. All of this is to say that genre also affects narrative, and can be used as an effective way to contest certain narrative schemes that are commonplace for certain genres. Depending on your framework, you can understand there to be a very limited range of narratives, but that would discount all of the scholarly work that has been done to demonstrate just how many there really are. There are as many kinds of narratives as there are writers hoping to be published. And while that may be a little bit hyperbolic, what we mean to say is that there are a lot. Some of the many examples are illustrated here, and we won't touch on them much right now. These were just a few narratives that came to mind when Tina and I spoke together in the brainstorming for this video. You can look at texts and identify a slave narrative structure. For example, sometimes even when it isn't strictly speaking a slave narrative in itself. Certain tropes and motifs, as well as a certain structure, in this case most likely a version of Aristotle's model of action, will tell you when a story is a quest narrative, and so on. These lines of thought are precisely what narratologists might concern themselves with on the job. As we've seen, there are multiple ways of defining genre and also multiple ways of approaching it, 
on a narratological level. One version of genre is that of genre fiction, which is particularly associated with the use of certain tropes that indicate genre affiliation. Because of that, genre fiction tends to be seen as formulaic and is kind of disparaged by many literary scholars, though this is thankfully starting to change. More and more, it is recognized that genre fiction often engages in highly innovative writing, experimenting with narrative tropes, which are still there, yes, but also employing diverse ways of narrating stories, be it the structure, the sequencing, see our video on narrative and time for that, or when it comes to the figure of the narrator, and you can also check out a separate video in this series for that topic. Examples are detective fiction, spy fiction, fantasy, science fiction, magic realism, horror, gothic, the weird, utopia, dystopia, westerns, space operas. But literary fiction is a genre itself. It has its own tropes and conventions. These can be identified both in what is usually called literary fiction and in genre fiction, where perhaps form and narrative structures play a special role in determining generic boundaries or the blurring thereof. It is certainly worthwhile to look at how genre fiction employs certain motifs and or tropes for its own purposes, and how it may draw on previous narrative structures or plot models such as the quest narrative or the Bildungsroman. And so as we come to a close, and in writing the script for this video, which I'm definitely reading, we thought to ourselves, how could we end? Should we perhaps opt for a cliffhanger? What about a cathartic realization of all we learned? Or an informative summary? A surprise twist recap? We could even simply end in medias res, showing us, closing the making of the video, and then drifting off as we say our goodbyes. But then we came to an excellent realization of our own. This video's genre, the tropes it relies on, and its reception, among other things, haven't really been fully defined by narratological scholarship. So I'm afraid we've got to leave you hanging. Thank you, and we hope you enjoyed the video.